everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, the federal finance minister tabled her budget. And once again, the federal government has uh, poured gasoline on the inflation crisis in Canada, not least by increasing the carbon tax on gasoline. Federal finances are deteriorating and there's complete lack of plan to return to balance. This budget overspends, overtaxes, overregulates, and will harm productivity, affordability, and economic growth. There are no measures to address the affordability crisis in the short term. Former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge said, without even seeing this budget, I think this is likely to be the worst budget since the budget of 1982, in the sense of pointing us in the wrong direction as to how we go about raising the incomes of Canadians and actually making Canadians feel better over the medium term. I'm afraid he was right. As the current Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem said in the fall, government spending is starting to get in the way of getting inflation back to target. Last week, Scotiabank validated this position in their analysis that read, and I quote, if not for such spending by the feds and provinces, the Bank of Canada would not have had to hike its policy rate by as much as it has and might have already been in a position to begin easing. They are trying to bribe Canadians with the deficit, fueling inflation that is hurting all Canadians. Their theme was supposedly intergenerational fairness, and yet they are saddling younger generations with their 10th consecutive deficit and increased levels of debt. The federal budget shows a stark contrast in priorities between the federal government and those of Canadians. The budget has an increase to the carbon tax, which will drive up costs on home heating, groceries, goods, and services across society. Increased taxes will cause those costs to be passed on to consumers and further increase costs for Canadians. As we grapple with an affordability crisis, the federal government is only making the problem worse. This federal government has failed to take decisive action on critical issues like Canada's alarmingly slow economic growth and the enormous financial pressures Canadians are experiencing. This budget represents yet another missed opportunity to solve any of these problems. Economic growth and investment should have been a big focus of the budget, given Canada's abysmal productivity performance and declining GDP, and these tax increases that are going to further impact investment. We will see over $60 billion a year in debt servicing costs by the end of the fiscal plan, increasing by a third over the five-year cycle, which is nearly the same they will be spending on the Canada health transfers to the provinces. Instead, we see rampant spending in the budget and the debilitating $40 billion deficit showcasing that Justin Trudeau and his government lack a plan to address affordability in the cost of living crisis in Canada. Alberta was one of only two provinces to balance the budget this year. With the changes to the tax code, we are seeing that the government is stifling economic growth and it spends recklessly without a glimpse at a plan to return to balance. Their economic projections are painting a rosier picture than can be expected, especially given their new changes to taxation. We see continued intrusion into areas of provincial jurisdiction with red tape and strings attached to any funding. We are also not seeing any updates on tax credits that have been promised for years. Just six weeks ago, I tabled a responsible plan that addresses the pressures created by Alberta's significant population growth within a balanced budget. The federal government's plan is to accrue tens of billions of dollars in additional debt and debt servicing costs while driving up the costs of housing, groceries and transportation. As tens of thousands of Canadians from across the country are moving to Alberta to call our province home, it is proof that in a nation that is beset by so many challenges, Alberta remains a bright beacon of responsibility and sanity. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. We're going to start in the room here. Please identify your name and your outlet, and we will go with one question, one follow-up. Uh, go ahead, Jonathan. Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. You voiced displeasure with the amount of money the Canadian government is spending in Budget 2024. What spending cuts do you believe need to be made? Well, I think it would be it would be helpful if there was a legitimate path to balance. A lot of uh, what this budget shows is they're uh, they're masking a lot of their spending intentions with the new tax increase. But we're seeing 50 billion in new spending over the five years. Uh, what I would like to see, I guess, is a is a legitimate path. Uh, something that Canadians can hang on to for the for the next five years and further into the future, 
Um, I think there's many places that the, the federal government can look. Obviously, budgets are, are a challenge. But some of the things that Alberta was looking for in this budget, uh, we wanted to see support for uh, strategic industries uh, impacted by federal policies related to the clean economy. Uh, there was nothing around ammonia or hydrogen. There was no updates on the CCUS ITCs that would actually spur on uh, investment. Uh, we wanted to see long-term flexible infrastructure funding uh, to replace ISIP. Uh, we, we didn't see that. What we did see was uh, some, some housing monies with heavy, heavy uh, linkages to uh, federal compliance and agreement with the federal government. Uh, we also wanted to see a top-up to LMTA funding, uh, the labor market uh, transfer agreement. Uh, we didn't see any of those things. So uh, not only did we not see really anything that, that we were after, uh, we see all of this excess spending. So it's, it's a combination of the two things. I would like to say one place that I, I was happy to see was they came out with $5 billion in spending on an Indigenous uh, um, government-backed loan uh, guarantee program uh, that kind of mirrors our AIOC program for $5 billion. Uh, so, and they made clear that that investment could be made in uh, natural resources and energy investments. So I think that's a positive. Do you have a follow-up, Jonathan? Yeah, and my follow-up kind of just, uh, you could say it was a clarification, but I'll use it as a follow-up. Um, so you mentioned that there are obviously with budgets, you know, you have to find areas um, to go into. Um, what particulars do you want to see the government spend less on or not spend anything on? Like, what particular programs? Well, I'd like to see programs highlighted that um, have a return on investment in the sense that they uh, add to the productivity of Canada. That's what the Bank of Canada governors have been clear, that we need to be about investment attraction in the upcoming years because our record is abysmal. So anything that could highlight that, um, while cutting regulation across the board, if, if the federal government would really like the provinces to be on board with, uh, with them and their housing plans, we need less regulation, we need to be able to move at speed uh, and actually build things. Thank you. Go ahead, Janet. Uh, so the justice budget says, because you're not creating dedicated family court judges, that they're going to reallocate that 11-ish million dollars per year across Canada to provincial superior courts that need more judges. What do you think about Alberta losing out on that money dedicated to family court judges? Well, I can't speak to that in too much um, with, with too, too many specifics. Uh, a lot of information we just consumed in the last hour. But I would, I would say something that's clear is with the, the caveats that the federal government is putting in place across the board, it does not appear to me like there's enough money in this federal budget that we should be chasing every dollar. In fact, maybe quite the opposite, that instead of entering into these uh, agreements that tie our hands for multiple years, they crack the door open, raise expectations of Albertans, and then leave us, leave us holding the bag, maybe, maybe quite the opposite, that we need to look at, uh, at going our own way. You have a follow-up, Janet? Yeah, just about student loans. I mean, we heard that the amount of money that you're having to allocate for student loans is growing. The federal government has extended their interest-free loans. Why not consider that for Alberta students? Well, I, th I think anything can be considered. You know, we have uh, we have put the, the cap on tuition. We've had to um, greatly add to that budget to deal with the, the overall volume of student loans just because we have so much more enrollment. So it's certainly something that we look at, but back to the fact that 61% of our budget is spent between advanced ed, education, and health, uh, it's, it's a challenge across the board. Last call for questions in the room, if anyone has any questions. Go ahead, Shalon. Yeah, you talked about uh, increases in taxation and stifling economic growth. I'm hoping you can expand a little bit more on those comments. I guess what particularly you're concerned about? Uh, so the the there's a lot of tax changes in here. I guess the big part would be around capital gains, uh, both for for people and for 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 individuals and for corporations. So they're uh, increasing the inclusion rate from uh, half to two thirds on. Uh, on levels over 250,000. Uh, my comment was that they did this, um, they used the, the private forecaster survey to get a lot of their economic data for the out years. 
uh, but that was done before the tax uh, changes came into place. So I think a lot of their economic assumptions in the years going forward uh, won't be this rosy. Uh, I, I don't know what the full impact will be, but that's some of the analysis I think should have been done. Yeah, just talk to me a little bit. We've heard from economists that say it could dampen investments. Uh, do you think that'll be the case here in Alberta? Well, it's it's hard to see that it wouldn't be. You're just you're taking away from the the pool of, of those that have the ability to invest. Uh, it may mean that they want to invest uh, elsewhere altogether, but it also will uh, will take away from what they have to invest. Um, and sorry, Catherine Grakowski, Alberta Day. Something that Christian Freeland said in her speech is that um, Trans Mountain Pipeline is a great national project, and it took an activist Liberal government to get it built. Um, wondering how you how you feel about um, her comments on the Trans Mountain Pipeline that she expects it to be. Up and running for Canada Day. Well, I guess I would just say I I don't mean to come off like a a negative person or a pessimist. I I am grateful I am grateful to Trans Mountain that they're beginning line fill. I think it is a good uh, good news story for our province and our country. Um, but let's not forget that this federal intrusion, overlapping of of environmental regulation, uh, chased off the other five uh, the other five pipeline projects. And that, you know, if we would have focused on having appropriate regulations and an investment uh, environment that provided clarity, the original build uh, of, of TMX was, I think, $7.4 billion. And I believe they're now that's closer to 35. And they'll have the challenge of how big of a write down will it need to become economic. They talk about wanting to sell it. Um, finding indig ind indigenous partners maybe to partner on it through this program. Um, but something that's clear is it would have to be written down uh, massively to become economic again. And, and one of the criticisms from advocacy groups from the opposition, they said that people's priorities are affordability, um, housing costs, and, and pharmacare, and you're saying, no, you know, we should go our own way. Um, why, why, why do you think that um, saying no to pharmacare, saying no to some of these affordable housing projects is what Albertans are looking for? I think what you're talking about is what Albertans truly care about. And I think housing and I think having affordable pharmacare, I think those that really is. I'm just saying that doesn't equate with what's being offered here. The pharmacare, the pharmacare plan in this budget, I believe, is $1.5 billion over five years. Um, uh, PBO, I think, estimated it needed to be at $40 billion if it was actually going to be universal pharmacare. It truly is just diabetes medication uh, and birth control products. So what I'm saying is we, we, have, uh, we have policies in this province that I think they address 500 different drugs. You know, I, I guess what I'm saying is you can't, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to focus on what truly is working here and make it better. But simply by them putting a, a name on it that would make you think it's universal pharmacare, that, that isn't the case. Um, when it comes to housing, we are putting many dollars out of the provincial budget towards different uh, programs around building affordable housing. We're trying to decrease regulation so the private sector can build as fast as possible. And they are setting records month to month. Um, but just because they say that that's what it's going to do doesn't mean that that's what we expect the outcome will be. And we have some of the best public servants, I think, in the Canada advising us of the very same thing. Thank you. And we'll head to the phones. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Chris Barco, Calgary Herald. Hi, Minister. You mentioned in your comments earlier on about the uh, market with the Indigenous Loan Guarantee Program. Um, what did you like about the announcement and the structure of what the federal government has brought forth in that strategy? Uh, thanks, Chris. Well, we haven't seen a lot of detail, but I was I was pleased to see that it specific high, specifically highlighted uh, natural resource uh, projects and energy projects. Uh, some of the rumblings we'd heard uh, said that they may uh, that they may make clear that they would it wouldn't be for investments like that. So I think that that's a, a good news story and very much aligns with our own AIOC. Uh, so I'm sure they'll they'll need to go through all of their diligence and uh, some of the challenges we had getting our program up, but I think it's a great start. You have a follow-up, Chris? Yeah, do you see any potential for AIOC and the federal programs to somehow um, team up 
I guess any, anything's possible. I know the, the feds have pretty much said as much, um, but like my earlier comments, I think because the, the, over, the, the cost escalation on the build was so high, um, my only uh, hesitation would be that it would have to be written down substantially to be made economic. Um, and we have very high diligence, um, a diligence process for, for the AIOC, so we need to ensure that these projects are, are very economic for the long term. Uh, we, we certainly don't want to saddle, uh, saddle anyone with a, an uneconomic investment, um, quite the opposite. We want these to be very safe uh, for the long term. Thanks, Chris. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Ben Kiderman, Cloven Mail. Hi, Minister Horner. Um, your remarks on the money that you're willing to turn down from the federal program, from the, the federal government, if the program, uh, you're, if you're worried about the program lasting or you're worried about the objectives, has your department done any serious work about how much federal money you could turn down for this principle? No, and this is more my observation, Kelly. Um, I think we need we need deals that uh, that work for our Alberta that are flexible, and we're not the only province saying this. Um, all the provinces are in in one way or another. So I I just mean we can't we can't chase every dollar. We have to look at the long term impacts and you know what what Albertans are are willing to put forward into the future. I, I could do some analysis of what's being offered by the federal government and. And um, and see what's on offer, but it's just a more more of a comment of what I'm seeing. Do you have a follow up, Kelly? Yeah, so I was just wondering if there if, if he had a chance, if Minister Horner had a chance to look at uh, the paragraph referring to equalization, how that number goes up more than four percent a year to the end of this decade, and whether you have any concerns there. Uh, I haven't been able to look at that specifically, but I will. Um, one of the things we've asked for consistently is around the floor mechanism uh, in equalization. Uh, there's a standing ask from uh, the provinces that we amend that piece of policy. It kind of makes it where uh, we think the floor, the floor moves in a way that it shouldn't at all in certain years, and it's what uh, allowed Ontario to be a, a net receiver of equalization funds this year. So we think there's... Uh, a, a lot of consensus around the provinces that that should be definitely looked at. Thank you, operator. Are there any more callers on the line? There are no other questions on the queue at this time. Last call for in the room. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, folks.